All right. Good evening. Uh, today's lecture that we're going to be uh, going through is on a new group of animals. So we're still going to be in the domain Eukarya, still in the kingdom Animalia. Uh, our title for the notes is the Cnidarians. Uh, that's right, it's spelled C-N-I-D-A-R-I-A-N-S is the first part. We're going to do this set of notes in two different sections. Um, uh, we have here the list of the entire classification that we're going to be looking at. Our domain is the Eukarya, still like I just mentioned. Kingdom Animalia. Our phylum is the phylum Cnidaria, C-N-I-D-A-R-I-A, with that C being silent. And there are actually four different classes in here today. In this set of notes, what we're going to be looking at is the characteristics that put organisms into that phylum Cnidaria, and then we're going to be looking at the characteristics of one of the classes, that's the class Hydrozoa. We'll take a look at these other ones in our next set of notes. So uh, please write down the domain Eukarya, Kingdom Animalia, uh, phylum Cnidaria, and class Hydrozoa, and then we'll hit the other ones in our next lecture. So, first off, we're going to talk about that structure and function of the organisms in this entire phylum Cnidaria as a whole. Uh, and for all of these particular organisms, they do have radial symmetry. That is, they have a round shape. So, going back into your notes previously, you should be able to figure out that with radial symmetry. There is no right or left sides for these organisms. Uh, their basic life cycle stages, a little bit unique, different than those sponges, those periphera. They take two different forms. The first one here is the polyp, and the second one here is the medusa form. For the polyp form, these are vase-shaped organisms. They're specialized for a sessile life, which we talked about last time, that sessile means attached. So in a picture over here on uh, this side of the screen, you kind of see this basic vase shape. It should uh, be somewhat familiar for some of you uh, as that sea anemone. So they have a bottom and it kind of opens up here on the top. The second form here is the medusa, or medusae, that's an E here after the A in parentheses. Uh, the medusa form is kind of bell-shaped. So think of the vase form like this and the medusa form like this. And that medusa form here is specialized for a swimming existence. For their body cavity, Kind of a little bit similar to that of those sponges, where we have two layers. Um, so their body cavity is made up of these two distinctive layers. They have the outer epidermis, that's that skin uh, layer. They have an inner gastrodermis, so that has something to do with your gastrointestinal area. Uh, so that gastrodermis here is the inside, has something to do with that digestive process, and then the epidermis here. Now, one of the unique things is they also, like those periphera, have a jelly-like substance in between those two layers. That jelly-like substance is called the mesoglia. That jelly-like substance is where we get the name, the jellies. We'll talk about those jellies uh, in our next set of notes. Last little bit here on this basic structure and function is the skeleton. Yes, jellies do have a particular type of skeleton the body uh, support system. It's very diverse in this group of cnidarians. Uh, some have a hydrostatic skeleton. That hydro tells you it has something to do with water. So they actually absorb water into their cells and use that water to provide support. They swell up like sea anemones and jellies. There are others that have a hard skeleton. They actually will um, secrete calcium carbonate. CaCO3, those are organisms like coral. So we have a couple different types of body supports uh, making up that skeleton for these organisms. Some unique structures that they have have to do with their feeding and defense uh, mechanisms. Uh, their special feature that you should be very, 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 very aware of, well versed in, is called a cnidocyte. C-N-I-D-O-C-Y-T-E-S, the cnidocyte is a special type of cell that these particular organisms have. Make sure you have that it's a special type of cell. This particular cnidocyte cell is used in feeding and in defense. 
inside that cell is an organelle unlike any other organelle that you might be familiar with. That organelle is called a nematocyst. Make sure you're spelling this correctly. We did talk about those gas-filled bladder structures with those multicellular algae called pneumatocyst, spelled very, very differently and have a very different function. The nematocyst, an organelle inside the cnidocyte, kind of looks like this. Here's our nidocyte cell right here in this kind of yellowish color. Inside is the nematocyst. There's a hair-like trigger here on the side. When that trigger is touched, brushed up against by some other organism, the nematocyst discharges, that is, it shoots out of this particular cell. Think of this kind of like a harpoon. It's a very long coiled filament inside. Sometimes there's poison, uh, sometimes it's barbed, on the end, other times it's just a long, thin, uh, coiled filament on the inside. But this will shoot out into the prey organism. And since this is one cell with an organelle, there's hundreds of millions of these cells inside each one of these different types of organisms. They use these particular structures as part of their feeding system, their digestive system. They have tentacles. On these tentacles are whole masses of these nidocytes, and they shoot these particular um, nematocysts out into their prey item, and then those tentacles pull that prey that's now pierced by these nematocysts in towards the gastrovascular cavity. They do have a mouth. You can kind of see it in this particular picture right here, this dark area in the middle. They'll pull their prey in towards that dark area, and push that prey into the gastrovascular cavity. They don't have a stomach. They don't have intestines. Inside the gastrovascular cavity is where the food is digested and nutrients are absorbed. They have what we call as scientists a sac-like gut. Very important. This gastrovascular cavity is a sac-like gut. That tells you, just like a garbage sack, it has one opening. You put the garbage in, and the garbage comes out that same back, uh, that same opening. They put the food in, the waste products are going to come out that same opening. So that sac-like gut, gastrovascular cavity, very important part of that digestive system. Now for their nervous system, they do have a nervous system. It is what we call a nerve net. I'll tell you right now, you need to know that. Nervous system information is very important for this particular class. A nerve net is just that. Think of a net covering the organism. And the lines of the net and the places where these two lines uh, are crossing are a little bit darker. That's what it looks like. Those are the nerve cells. So it's this very, very large web of interconnected nerve cells covering uh, the outside of the organism. There are some of these forms that actually have more of them clustered in certain areas, like the medusa, that bell-shaped form has nerve cells around the edge of that bell so that it can control that pulsating, swimming-like motion, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. The function uh, of the nerve net is a little bit unique. What it does allow for, different than the periphera, is if you touch a sea anemone, one of these cnidarians here on the side, it can send signals to the entire rest of the body that there is some interaction with the outside environment. And so it causes the whole organism to be able to respond to some external stimulus that helps in controlling the tentacle movement. And like this one here is pulling this starfish in towards the mouth. So all of these tentacles will react. The mouth will be able to open up. It will send signals to the other tentacles to help with that particular pulling motion. It also helps with that rhythmic contraction of the bell of jellies as they move through the water. Instead of having one side contract and another side contract, it wouldn't go anywhere. So we have all of the entire circumference of that bell contracting at the same time to push water out and bring water in to propel it through the water. Circulation and respiratory system here, very simple, easy one. There isn't any particular system for either. Diffusion rules the day here. There's only two layers and that jelly-like mesoglia in the middle. So 
Water is able to bring the, uh, uh, oxygen very close to all of the cells, and so oxygen is able to diffuse in. And CO2, carbon dioxide, is able to diffuse out. They don't need to circulate it around because the water that they're living in does that for them. There is one place where most of this circulatory and respiratory action does take place, and that's in the gastrovascular cavity. The vascular part has to do with that circulatory system. Our vascular system is our system of veins, arteries, those particular capillaries and other blood vessels. They just have this big cavity. What this big cavity here inside the organism does, it allows for water to move in and be very near the cells on the inside. Water is already very near the cells on the outside, so it allows for water to be very close to all of their particular cells. This is where that oxygen is brought into the organism and CO2 is released. For reproduction and development of these organisms, uh, they have sexual reproduction. So sexual reproduction does occur. That means we need some eggs and we need some sperm to get together. When those eggs and sperm get together and they fertilize uh, that egg, they do it in the water column. That fertilized egg is going to become what we call a planula larva. We'll have a chance a little bit later on to look at the planula larva, actually see what those guys look like under a microscope, very small. But because it's a larva, this is indirect development. They do not develop directly into an adult version. The planula larva is uh, cylindrical. It's ciliated, so it has cilia all around it, and it's able to move using that cilia uh, throughout the water. It does consist of two layers of cells, one on the outside, one on the inside, and as that cylindrical ciliated larva, the planula larva, moves throughout the water, it'll swim down towards the bottom, find a place to attach to using the cilia, and then morph into uh, the adult. They also have asexual reproduction. We'll kind of get into some of these details a little bit more uh, later on in our next set of notes with some of the other ones, but each one of these polyps, these vase-shaped, such as these guys here, these particular polyps are able to bud new polyps. So we could have had only one of them here, and it budded several others. We also can have one here that buds a separate one that pops off and lives its own particular life. So this asexual reproduction allows organisms that are living very well to reproduce genetically identical versions uh, of themselves. Sometimes those genetically identical versions are separate. Sometimes they stay together and live as a colony. Talk about that budding here. Now, that's all the information for the particular organisms in this phylum Cnidaria. But there's a lot of different organisms in the phylum Cnidaria. So we're going to break it down a little bit more. We're going to go from domain, eukarya, kingdom, and Amelia, phylum, Cnidaria, we're going to go all the way down to the class Hydrozoa. Now, the class Hydrozoa has some very specific kinds of organisms in there. They're related to each other. They're a Cnidarian, but they're different than some of the other Cnidarians. And so we'll look at these uh, Hydrozoa here uh, very, very quickly. A couple pictures of some different types of Hydrozoa. And you look at these and you say, okay, well, this guy does not really look like this one very much. Uh, we'll take a look at the differences here uh, in just a second. This particular class is very diverse. There's lots of different ones, as is the evidence here by the pictures. But most all of them are what we call colonial. That is, they have different individuals attached together, making up one larger uh, organism. A couple examples that we'll talk about here. The first one is this one down uh, right next to me here in the picture, and that is uh, the genus Obilia, O-B-E. L-I-A, put it in italics there, that's how we uh, show you that it is, in fact, a uh, genus name. Uh, the obilia, these are all colonial polyps. So all of these are polyps, there's no swimming uh, for the obilia uh, in this particular case. Uh, they're attached to these stalks that branch off from each other. But the interesting thing about the obilia is that some of these polyps have different jobs than other ones. Certain ones are, are only to gather food. And once they gather food using the tentacles, uh, they bring those nutrients once they're digested 
into the rest of the organism and the nutrients move back and forth to the other polyps that aren't gathering food. Some of them are for reproduction only. And those particular ones that reproduce, they do something a little bit different. They're actually going to bud off of them little teeny tiny medusa, the bell-shaped ones. And those medusa will swim away from the parent organism. And those medusa are then going to form egg or sperm cells, release the egg or sperm cells out into the water column because they're swimming around. And those eggs and sperm cells meet. Those eggs uh, are fertilized by the sperm. And those particular ones will form the planula larva, which swims around even more, finds a substrate where it can land and attach to, and morphs into a polyp. So you can kind of get an idea that uh, these organisms can spread themselves out uh, very, very, very well. A second uh, example here is the Portuguese Man of War, so the Portuguese Man of War. That's this guy up here. Some of you might have heard of a Portuguese Man of War before. This is a hydrozoa in the phylum Cnidaria. It is an animal. The unique thing about the, this guy here is a colony of actually both polyps and medusa hooked together. This top portion up here, it's kind of clear, a little bit harder to see. A little uh, purpley area down here. This is a polyp. There's actually two of them, one here and then one up here that actually sticks out of the water a little bit. The Medusa part is this darker area here that's kind of black and then trails into this uh, blue area. That's the upside down, the bell-shaped portion with these tentacles that are, are hanging down. The polyps are very specialized. They're specialized to act as a float. They're actually filled with gas so that it keeps it up on the surface and here as a sail. Has this flat area so that when the wind blows across the water, it will blow these Portuguese man of war around uh, the ocean. Their tentacles are very long compared to the body. You notice that there's this bluish, blackish color, which happens to be the same color that the water is. So when organisms are moving through the water, whether it's a person or whether it's a, a marine organism, they can't see these tentacles very well. They get hit by those tentacles, and those particular tentacles are filled with those nidocyte cells that have tremendous amounts of nematocysts, and those nematocysts will fire into your cells, and that's the sting that we are feeling. So this is our Portuguese man of war. A very, very, very painful sting. Most of these guys are preying on small fish, but we humans uh, have come into contact with these guys quite uh, often, and sometimes that sting can be fatal to humans. Because if we get hit by one of these, our first instinct is to start thrashing around. Ouch, something is hurting. Well, as we thrash around more, we get wrapped up around all of these tentacles, and they keep uh, firing those medicists into our uh, particular cells. Not good times. So those are uh, a couple examples here, the obilia and the Portuguese man of war, uh, of organisms within the class hydrozoa. That's uh, all for our notes. Perfect timing right there. Um, we will be doing the um, essential questions at the beginning of next class period, and then we'll uh, have a couple other activities as well.